which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began with Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I'd like to tell you this morning about a good man, a good man who prayed a lot, a good man who gave to people who were in need, a good man who was apparently good to his family, he was well respected by the community, but he didn't know much about Jesus of Nazareth yet, if anything. So what do you tell him? Well, the man's name was Cornelius. You read about him in Acts chapter 10. And the reason he's significant there is because he was of a different race than the Jews. So far, the Jews were God's chosen people so that Christ could come through them. For 1,500 years, God had spoken specifically to the Jews. There were some other times he'd venture out and speak to some other people and expect some things from them, but the written law was for the people of Israel. And then that written law prophesied about a Messiah. That Messiah came. They crucified him, thinking that he was not the Messiah. And then he proved that he was by his glorious resurrection three days later. In Acts chapter 2, Peter had to preach a sermon about him to some people that didn't know about him yet. And they were all Jewish people, although they were from places scattered all over the world. The first thing he did was tell them that your Old Testament prophets prophesied about Jesus of Nazareth. Joel prophesied about these days. David prophesied about these days. He mentions prophecies from up to a thousand years ago. And then he says, yet in spite of all those prophecies where he was predicted and everything he did fulfilled all those things, you killed him. When the people wondered what to do after all of that, he told them you need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. Well, the Jews then were getting the gospel in the early history of the church that is recorded for us in this book of Acts, penned by Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Jews were getting this gospel. It started in Jerusalem. It spread out to the country around them, Judea. It spread a little bit north to Samaria, a little northeast to the people that the Jews didn't like all that much. And then it was destined to go to everybody in the known world. And it would in one generation, according to Colossians 1.23. But first there was a racial barrier that had to be broken. To break that racial barrier was no easy thing for God to do. Cornelius was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. He was a good man, though. But he didn't know Jesus, and he was not saved yet, even though he was a good man. So God sent an angel in that miraculous age. The age of the miraculous was only for that time of change, for Judaism to Christianity. And it wasn't to be for all time. But in that miraculous age, God sent an angel to Cornelius and said, I want you to send some men down to a city called Joppa and get Peter, Simon Peter from there. He's staying with Simon a Tanner. Get him, bring him back to you. So he does that. He sends two of his household servants and a devout soldier. And then Peter is down in Joppa at the time and he's up on the housetop praying, which was common for them with their flat roofs and to get away from the bustle of the city below. He was up on the housetop praying. He fell into a trance and he saw a vision of all kinds of different animals coming down in a sheet and being taken back up. And then he heard a voice, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Well, he was sensitive to the Jewish law that said you couldn't eat just any kind of animal. So he said to the voice, no, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice said to him, not just once, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. He was wondering what that vision meant. It probably had to do something with more than meats, you might imagine. He was wondering what that vision meant when those three fellows came knocking at the door. And Peter finally went back with them and then he finally realized what it meant. After a little bit of time, he went into Cornelius and his family. They're waiting there to hear what this angel wanted them to hear. They're waiting there to hear this message. And Peter, uh, Peter finally gets it. You know, the gospel... Jesus of Nazareth was not just for Israel. It was for everybody on the planet. Even these Gentiles. 
In verses 34 and 35, he famously says, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Then, after he makes that observation, what's he going to say to Cornelius? Cornelius needed to hear about Jesus of Nazareth. What you have then is about a seven verse sermon in which Peter succinctly covers everything that Cornelius needed to know at the start, anyway, about Jesus. And here's how he started it. Verse 36. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began in Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And we... Are witnesses, he said, we the apostles are witnesses to the things, all the things which he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree, whom God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And it was he who commanded us. Preach to the people and to testify that it was he who was ordained to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Now that's the end of the sermon, but it's not the end of the conversation and it's not the end of the incident. Do you see what Cornelius needed to know about Jesus to start with. I dare not say this is all he ever needed to know. Christianity, when people begin it with their baptism into Christ like those folks on Pentecost did, that's just the very beginning. But here's what he needed to know up front. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, verse 36. Well, God had called Abraham 2,000 years before that, told him he was going to bless all nations through his seed. He started having children, they, and finally they started having children and more children. They went down into Egypt for a while, they came back up out, and 1,500 years before Christ came, God gave them a law at Mount Sinai. In that law, and then through the prophets that came later, they kept predicting about this Messiah that was going to come, this suffering servant who was going to die on behalf of the people. In the meantime, they had all these sacrifices they had to give, they had all these feasts they had to keep, they had incense they had to burn to teach them about spiritual things. And finally, Christ came. And then it was Christ's plan, as he said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, to start preaching to the people of Israel. Jews first, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. So then, God sent this word to the people of Israel, preaching peace. That's the second phrase in verse 36. Preaching peace through Jesus Christ. And then notice this, in, in the New King James, there's a hyphen before it and a hyphen after it. An offset phrase. Preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Well, that connects to what he said in verses 34 and 35, that with God there's no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. God wanted there to be peace among people. There are the Old Testament prophecies about how during this messianic era, the people would, at least, in, at least figuratively, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And they wouldn't lift up sword against nation and they would not learn war anymore. Isaiah chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 and Micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 4. There were all those prophecies. God wanted there to be peace among people. Our world desperately needs peace. We're so divided and we're so at each other's throats and you feel like you can't talk to people. I've been in public places before where you felt like you could make conversations with people. I'm thinking specifically of airports right now. But now you're afraid to say anything to anybody. Anybody's afraid to say anything to you. People are so divided. Here's the place for peace. 
It's in Jesus Christ. He's called the Prince of Peace in prophecy in Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7. And he wanted there to be peace. Paul says in Ephesians 2 verses 13 through 16 that he came to bring peace between Jew and Gentile. He, he himself is our peace. He wanted to reconcile them both to God in one body. That's the church through the cross. He says in Ephesians 2 verse 16. God wanted there to be peace. And there is. There is. We may all be of the same sort of culture and all the same sort of background today, but all over the world this morning, there are people meeting together that are of different backgrounds, that are of different countries, that are of different nationalities, different religions, different races, different upbringings, but they've all come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and they've all, these people about whom I'm speaking, they've all obeyed Him, they've all been added to His church when they were baptized into Christ, and they're getting along. Because God shows no partiality and they know they shouldn't either. That's where peace is. We could have peace. More so in this world. If more people would follow Jesus Christ. His teachings are not to be mocked. His teachings are not to be repudiated. He's the one who teaches. The way you want to be treated, treat others that way. Love God first, your neighbor as yourself those are the kind of teachings that, that bring us to peace. Now he warned that people wouldn't always accept him. And so even families would be divided when people wouldn't accept him. But he knew that in as much as people would accept him, there would be peace among those people. People fight today. Because some people don't like the ethics that Christ has. People fight today because some people don't like what Christ is. People fight today because some people have taken the gospel of Christ and twisted it to their own power and their own corruption. And people rightfully rebel against that, but they go too far and think that there is no God and no Christ who loves them. When Christ is taught the way he ought to be taught, when his teachings are passed on the way he designed for them to be passed on, then people can come to peace. Middle East is always fraught with strife. The Jews rejected their Messiah. The Arabs think Muhammad is the Messiah. If they would both go back to Jesus Christ and accept him, there'd be peace. The word which God sent to Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now verse 37, that word you know. So maybe he'd heard some of it. Maybe Cornelius and his family heard some of it, but not all of it. That word you know that was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began in Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Well, Cornelius needed to know, and maybe Peter later informed him a little bit more about this. Maybe he'd already heard about this some. The John the Baptist was prophesied to be a forerunner of the Christ. He would come and tell people to repent. And he would say, I'm not the Messiah. There's one that comes after me. He'd point to Jesus and say, there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He'd baptize people with a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Mark chapter 1 verse 4, foreshadowing what Christ would do. He got people ready for Christ. And after he got people ready for Christ in what was maybe just only about a six-month ministry... He was put in prison. After he was put in prison, Jesus came up to that area of Galilee. That area of Galilee was a rough region. They'd been decimated by war several times. They were populated somewhat by pagans who were intermixing with the Jews and bringing in their immoral and idolatrous ways. But Jesus went up there first, right after his temptation in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Verse 12 says, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Now, now there's a reference to what we know as Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, where Jesus quotes from it, or I'm sorry, Matthew quotes from it to explain the prophecy. That the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, those were two tribes of Israel that lived there on the northwest of Gal the Sea of Galilee, by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles as it was called, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light and upon those who were sat in the shadow of death a great light has dawned. These people lived a miserable life but now Jesus goes to them first. The word was preached throughout all Judea but it started in Galilee. Jesus always went to the people that were the outcasts, the people that were needed, that needed him so much first. So he went there and, and people started to follow him. 
people started to come to him. Luke chapter 4 says that they fought, or Matthew chapter 4 rather, verse 25 says that they followed him from Galilee. They followed him from the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which was Decapolis, a region of ten cities, met metropolises together. And then they followed him from Jerusalem, Judea. They followed him from everywhere. Great multitudes came to him. And he was quite popular among the people. Peter refers to all of that by those few words. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began in Galilee after the baptism which John preached. And then he gives us a little bit of a hint into the ministry of Jesus. Sums up the ministry of Jesus in just a few words. We can spend our lives studying it and we should. But he sums it up with these powerful words inspired by the Holy Spirit in verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Well, at Jesus' baptism, which he was baptized for righteousness' sake, he didn't have any sins to be forgiven, but he was baptized because that's what John was requiring of people through God's guidance, and he wanted to not leave it out. So Jesus was baptized, and when he was, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove on him from heaven, and a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So there you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in one place. God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Is there any, is there any argument with that? You find somebody that's going to go about and just do good. And heal people who are oppressed by the devil. It didn't say healing all who were sick. Not everybody who was sick would be healed. You know Jesus himself points that out. In Luke chapter 4, when he starts that Galilean ministry, he comes to the synagogue. He's been preaching in the synagogues and teaching the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 4 says. And in Matthew chapter 4, it says that he's healing all kinds of diseases and among the people. And his fame spread throughout all Syria so that they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And even those who were demon possessed and epileptics and paralytics and he healed them all. He's just going about doing good. But during that time, Luke chapter 4 records that he comes to his own synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. He picks up the scroll and he reads from another passage in Isaiah which says... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Isaiah 61 had prophesied that the Spirit of the Lord would be upon this Messiah. He's, he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He says, that's why I'm here, to do good. And if the devil's oppressing you, I want to help. And then he closed the book. And he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That is, I'm the Messiah. He knew they were going to reject him. He knew they were going to call on him to do some great miracles there. Mark chapter 6 records for us that he didn't do many miracles in his hometown because people didn't believe too much. And he knew that miracles wouldn't make them believe if they weren't going to, so he didn't do that too much. Now that's some of my interpretation. But you read Mark 6, 1 through 6 and see if you don't get that message. But in Luke chapter 4 then, he tells them, you're going to say, physician, heal yourself. You're going to say, do some more things. You know what he tells them? Back in the days of Elijah, about 800 years before he came, back in the days of Elijah, there were many widows during this drought, but Elijah was only sent to one widow to help her, the widow of Zarephath. Remember that in 1 Kings 17, he went to the widow of Zarephath. She thought she was going to starve because she only had enough oil and enough flour or meal for one loaf of bread. She was going to make that. Her son and her were going to eat it, and then they were just going to wait to die. But he performed the miracle that allowed the jar of oil not to run out and the bread not to run dry until finally rain came again. But then the boy died anyway and he brought the boy back to life. These were great things. But he said they didn't happen for everybody. The miracles were never meant to be miracles to heal the sick of all time. They were meant to show that he could, oppress, he could heal those who were oppressed by the devil. And so he did in his ministry. Demon possession existed at that time for the very purpose of showing that Jesus and then later his apostles had the power over them. 
these demons would possess people apparently against their will, but Christ could cast them out. The demons don't do that anymore, but the devil still oppresses people. He oppresses people by getting them hooked on things that are going to destroy them. Going to destroy them physically, going to destroy them spiritually. He may have them hooked on porn. He may have them hooked on adultery. He may have them hooked on drugs. He may have them hooked on alcohol. He may have them hooked on hate. But these people are oppressed by the devil. And the reason Jesus came was to free people from that sort of thing. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. I want to remember that phrase. I want that phrase to stick in my head when I see people who put on a play to mock Jesus Christ because of his stand on morality, which I saw back in 2013 in the, in the uh, California area. When they put on a play and they mock him because, well, he takes a stand for morality that we don't like. When they choose to say that all Christians are evil. No, Jesus just came to do good and to heal people who were oppressed by the devil. That's what he did. And then Peter offers some proof in his sermon, verse 39. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. See, these things weren't done in private. Now, if you want to talk about Muhammad's miracles, they were all done in the privacy of a cave and he told somebody about them later and got people to believe them later and nobody had any idea of seeing anything. If you want to talk about Buddha, you got the same sort of thing. But if you talk about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he never even claimed to do anything in secret. There were always witnesses of his resurrection, of his resurrected body in the 40 days that he wandered the earth from the time that he came out of the grave till the time he was ascended into heaven. There were over five hundred witnesses. So this is what Peter's referring to here. And we are witnesses. These twelve, we are witnesses of all these things he did among the Jews and in Jerusalem. We're witnesses of his ministry, not just his resurrection. And we're witnesses of what they did next. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. Well, that was prophesied too. That wasn't any accident. We're witnesses of everything that he did doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. We're witnesses of his murder, his judicial, supposedly legal murder. But then, on the third day, God raised him up. We're witnesses of that too. And showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even those of us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. In Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 41, Jesus makes one of his post-resurrection appearances to the 12 disciples. Judas is already gone, so there's technically 11. And they think it's a ghost at first. They don't believe it. They don't understand it. It's not like they're looking for him. It's not like they plotted to steal him. They think he's a ghost to start with. So Jesus says, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. Does a spirit have flesh and bones as you see I have? And when they still had trouble believing, he said, see my hands and my feet, I've got flesh and bones. When they still had trouble believing, he said, have you got any food here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb and he took it and ate in their presence to prove that he was real, a body. So we have the purposes of Jesus. He came about to preach peace. He came about to do good. He came about to heal all who were oppressed by the devil. And we have the proofs of Jesus. He was prophesied and he was witnessed as being resurrected from the dead. And if he hadn't been resurrected from the dead, nothing else that he did would have mattered. He'd have been a liar because he said that he would be resurrected from the dead. But even all the good that he did wouldn't have mattered if he hadn't been resurrected from the dead. But as Paul says powerfully in Romans 1 verses 3 and 4, he's the son of David according to the flesh, but declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. How do I know he's the son of God? Because he's raised from the dead. How do I know that? Because all those witnesses that wrote at that time, because these books that survived, and because of the way the world changed. Why do I believe that his way of morality is right? Because he's resurrected from the dead. Why do I believe I ought to love my neighbor as myself? Because he's resurrected from the dead. Why do I believe I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins? Because he's resurrected from the dead. Why do I believe I need to worship him on the Lord's day and not forsake the assembling of the saints? Because he's resurrected from the dead. That verifies everything. It establishes everything. So in verse 41, there's, there's 42 rather, there's something else to be established. Another purpose. 
Peter doesn't have a, a sermon outline like I would have where he gives all the purposes first and then all the proofs. Sounds gonna, he kind of bounces back and forth. His purpose is to preach peace among people. His purpose is to do good. His purpose is to heal people who are oppressed by the devil. Here's proof of him with these witnesses. But then here's another purpose. Verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it was he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. We'll all stand before him someday. And we won't be answering to our wives. We won't be answering to our husbands. We won't be answering to the city council. We won't be answering to the state legislature. We won't be answering to Congress or the Supreme Court. But as a matter of fact, we all, including all of those people who make up all of those bodies, will stand before Jesus Christ and answer for what we did. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul wrote, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or evil. But here's the thing. You want to have a problem with Jesus judging you? People say, oh, we shouldn't judge. Jesus would never judge. Jesus was not like that. Well, read all of the scriptures. Jesus is very compassionate toward people who were sin. He died for us so that we wouldn't have the sin to our account when we came before him. But he makes some conditions of us coming before him. He's merciful, but he's also just. He's so merciful that when I come to him and re have to recount my life, he's not going to see the sins that are there because they've been covered in his blood. If at least I keep trying to obey him the rest of my life as I've tried thus far. He's so merciful that he'll allow me in even though I could still recall the things that I did that were bad. But he's just. And those people who haven't obeyed him and continued to rebel against him are going to have to answer to him someday. And if he's just, he can't be merciful without being just. If he's just, then with tears streaming from his faces, if you allow that analogy, from his face, he'll turn his face away. And say, depart from me, you wicked, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. That's a combination of his words from Matthew 25 and Matthew 7. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it was he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Someday we'll all get there and we'll all answer. And we'll all answer for whether or not we obeyed the gospel. Whether or not we believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Whether or not we confessed Him. Whether or not we repented of our sins. Whether or not we were baptized for the remission of our sins. We'll answer for whether or not we forsook the assembly of our own will all the time. We'll answer for everything that we've done. And I just want to see His loving eyes. And hear some forgiveness. When I say I just tried to do my best. I think He promises that. As the propitiation for our sins. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. And then Peter wraps up the sermon by going back to proof. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. All the prophets told about that. Back in Acts chapter 3 verse 24 Peter said the same sort of thing. He said yes and Samuel from Samuel on from all the prophets from Samuel on have also foretold these days. These were the that was the pinnacle of God's plan of history. Everything forward, before that looked forward to Christ coming. Everything after that looks backward to Christ coming and looks forward to Him coming again to be our judge. That was the, the pinnacle of history. Well, that's the end of the sermon, but that's not the end of the action. And that's not the end of what happens. Peter didn't probably get to finish before the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his family. And that's not something that happens to me and it's not something that happens to you. That's something that happened twice in the history of the world. To those representatives of the Jews on Acts chapter 2, the apostles, so that they could preach the gospel to the people in all those different languages. And then it happened to the first Gentiles to show that God was preaching peace equally to all men. So after that Holy Spirit fell on them and they began to speak in other languages they'd never studied too, Peter asks this rhetorical question. Can anyone forbid water that these should be, not be baptized who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? You see why God did it in that statement. Why would they receive the Holy Spirit? To prove that they were equal to the Jews. 
in God's sight and they could have the baptism for the remission of sins too which was distinct and separate from the baptism if you will of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles then it fell on Cornelius and his family and in between what they preached was repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins so 3,000 people were baptized in water in the symbol that God gave on the day of Pentecost and people just kept being baptized because they believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They were reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ when they did so, according to Paul in Romans chapter 6, which makes sprinkling just completely irrelevant because baptism has to be an immersion. That's what the word means, and it's to reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So people just kept doing that, and they've been doing it now for 2,000 years. But notice what happened here. Cornelius was a good man. Cornelius prayed. Cornelius gave. Cornelius did all these great things. But he still was commanded, even after he received the Holy Spirit, he was commanded to be baptized in the name of the Lord for the remission of his sins. He was a good man. Well, I'm, a good, I'm better than my neighbor over there. He even had the Holy Spirit directly come upon him, but he still had to be baptized in water for the remission of his sins. And he did it immediately. Nobody ever waited. What do you tell somebody about Jesus when they need to hear and they haven't heard much? Tell them that he was crucified for their sins. Tell them that he was resurrected from the dead. Tell them that he ascends on, ascended on high and he's just waiting there for people to hear the gospel so that they can be saved and he's hoping more and more people will. And tell them that they can be saved through his blood. This morning, if you haven't been baptized, we hope you would be. If you've been unfaithful to him after that, we'd hope you'd come back. If we could help you, please come as we stand and sing. Who will follow Jesus standing for